All right, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Jose. I'm with the Lowell Observatory and welcome to our interactive stargazing. And also happy May the 4th. May the 4th be with you. <laughs> uh, but uh, today we are taking requests for various objects in space. Uh, so if you have anything in particular you wanna look at, uh, you can go ahead and request it in the chat and we'll uh, try and pull it up and we can show pictures here. Uh, so what we're looking at here is we have a, a camera attached to one of our telescopes at our new Giovanni Open, Open Deck Observatory called um, a Mallon Cam, and it's attached to a plane wave CDK 14 inch telescope. And what we're showing through the camera right here is a little protoplanetary nebula. And so you can see at the very center, there's a star that looks a little bit less like a star. Uh, and that's kind of what that is. So a protoplanetary nebula is a star at the end of its life. It's going to be a small solar mass type star. And this is right after it's left its red giant phase and right before it goes into the planetary nebula phase. So hence the proto in the name. Uh, and so you can see some jets of gas uh, out of the poles that, that you can see little like kind of pointy things sticking right out of the star right there. And that's jets of gas that are spewing out of the poles as it's become very unstable uh, as it's entering this new phase in its life. Um, I always like to describe stars like Pokemon because they go through various stages. And this one is uh, almost in the final evolutionary stage that a star goes through. Uh, it's like a blastoise turning into a mega blastoise. Um, uh, so uh, this star is actually, it's called the Frosty Leo Nebula, and that's because it's found in the constellation Leo the Lion, and it's been given the subtitle Frosty because uh, astronomers have found a lot of water ice in the composition of this particular nebula, which is very interesting, and hence the Frosty title. Uh, so for once, there's something that's named after its actual physical attributes, not about just what it looks like. This, this uh, Frosty Leo Nebula is about 3,000 light years away as well. Uh, so um, I see that we have a few requests that have already come in. Uh, so Tom C. is asking to look at a Bell 31, which is in Cancer. Uh, so why don't we go ahead and that's a perfect, a uh, perfect opportunity since we can talk a little bit more about the evolution of stars. We just looked at a protoplanetary nebula, and a Bell 31 is a planetary nebula. Uh, so this is the next stage right after the frosty Leo nebula. And they go through all these stars, they go through these various stages, but they take a long time for these stages to happen. So we can't ever see a star live its entirety of its life, but we can see a whole bunch of stars in various uh, moments in their lives. And we can start to piece together uh, the order of like how things are supposed to be happening in a star's life. Small stars like our sun, and stars that become planetary nebulae, those ones, they live for billions and billions of years. Uh, they could live 12 to even 14 billion years old. Our own sun has a life expectancy of somewhere between seven and 10 billion years. Uh, don't worry, it's only about halfway through there. So we're not going to see the sun enter its next stage in its evolution, the red giant phase, uh, for quite some time yet. A star like our sun is in the, what we call the main sequence. What you can see here, what they're doing, by the way, is they're using the telescope controls to control the telescope. And they had to search for the star Abel 31. And you can see these streaks on this photo here are the camera taking pictures while the telescope is moving. So we get a little bit of star trails happening when we do that. And uh, Hmm, I uh, don't particularly, this one's probably a pretty faint star, or sorry, not star, pretty faint nebula, but if the operator can use a little hand to circle that little blue th thingy, 
I bet you that's what there you go. Yeah, uh, right next. Yeah, right there. That little blue thing. You see that? That's the planetary nebula right there. This is a 12th magnitude um, object. Uh, 12th magnitude means it's very faint. When we say what magnitudes are, the really bright stars have really low numbers for their magnitudes, and the brightest stars are sometimes negative numbers. And so the bigger the number, the fainter it is. Uh, our camera, or our Malin cam and our plane wave telescope together can image things probably at about 14th magnitude before it starts getting too faint for us to see. Uh, but yeah, so there's this one star that looks like a blue star, uh, but that's actually our planetary nebula right there. Um, planetary nebulae often appear blue, and that's going to be because of um, mostly the ionized oxygen that we find in the chemical composition for these. They have a lot of oxygen and that often appears blue or green in our cameras and our telescopes. Uh, so yeah, so as I mentioned, the sun, the sun's final stage is going to be a planetary nebula, like uh, probably a lot like this one. This is many billion years, this is five to six billion years in the future, so I'm sure. And then of course, after a long period of time, that gas that's surrounding a white dwarf, that gas dissipates into space, it goes away, and the white dwarf will be much harder to find without the gas that's surrounding it anymore. Um, all right, so we have uh, some requests for some uh, globular clusters. So we have uh, we have someone, John, oh my gosh, Scarangelo is requesting M3 or M53. So let's go ahead and get M3 up. This is one of the, one of my favorite globular clusters uh, to look at. This one, I believe, is found in the constellation Canis Venatici, which is the two hunting dogs, which is just two stars, but it is an official constellation. <laughs> Uh, so here we have a globular cluster, and uh, M3, so globular clusters like this, uh, we find maybe about 150 to 200 of them uh, in the halo of our galaxy, which is sort of just outside the spiral arms, um, just like above and below uh, our galactic disk. We can imagine our galaxy is like a flat disk, like a fried egg, and uh, you'd find the globular clusters kind of hanging out here or kind of here or so. And there's there's about 200 of them. And they're all kind of collected near the core of the galaxy. Uh, these are densely packed clusters of stars that could feature 50 to 500,000, 50,000 to 500,000 stars in them. And some of them are massive enough that some astronomers think there may be some black holes in a few of them. And I don't believe M3 is one of those black hole candidates though. Uh, but these are certainly some of the prettiest objects that we have to offer when we do um, any, any of our viewing through our telescopes. I always think that it looks like someone just like sneezed glitter right onto the camera, or right onto the eyepiece of the telescope, which kind of sounds gross now that I think about it. Uh, but yeah, there's a whole bunch of stars here and the majority of these are going to be stellar or sun-like mass stars. Uh, so these are all gonna be very small, long-lived stars and some of them are might even be older than our own galaxy. That's how old these stars in these globular clusters get. Uh, so M3 is always a really good one to look at. Uh, <laughs> So um, someone requested uh, M74, but unfortunately that one is located in uh, Pisces. So we're not going to be able to look at that. And uh, someone also wanted to look at Vega in the constellation Lyra. And however, Vega, while it is above the horizon, it's getting higher and higher every single day. Uh, Vega is just a little bit too low and here in Flagstaff we are famous for all of our really tall pine trees so it's still a little bit behind those pine trees and the telescope can't reach that far. Uh, we also had someone uh, requesting a red giant star so let's go ahead and go to the red giant star Arcturus which is 
my favorite star in the spring sky. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and go to Arctur Ar we're gonna arc to Arcturus. <laughs> we have this saying, us astronomers, if we're trying to find Arcturus, we use the Big Dipper and we'll use the handle of the Big Dipper to point to it, it arcs to Arcturus. And this is a red giant star. And so since we were talking about the stellar evolutionary stages right before, this is the next stage in our sun's life. So our sun will eventually expand into a red giant star. That's uh, again, five to seven billion years from now. So we got quite some time to get ready for this. And uh, its core is gonna get a lot hotter. And so it's gonna push out all sorts of gas and it's going to become bigger in size. Uh, not bigger in mass, it's going to keep about the same mass and it'll become cooler in temperature and thus a little bit redder in color right there, where its surface temperature becomes a little bit cooler, right? This, this star Arcturus is located in the constellation Boetes and uh, us educators here at Lowell, we always know that spring is just around the corner when we start to see Arcturus for the first time in the evening. And we know that it's going to be just a little bit warmer and soon we won't have to wear so many layers at work. And uh, Arcturus is also known as the bear herder. Arcturus is Greek and it roughly translates to bear herder and this is actually where we get Arctic from as well. And uh, it's very close to Ursa Major and Ursa Minor, the constellations, the great bear and the minor, the minor bear, the little bear. <laughs> And you can kind of see that it circles around them. It's kind of chasing them around the North Pole, the North Celestial Pole. And so we see it rising in the spring when the bears come out of hibernation and right at fall when the bears go back into hibernation, uh, the two bears go away and so does our bear herder. And this star is actually kind of interesting uh, because it's going a little bit faster and in a different direction than some of the other stars in our neighborhood. And so astronomers think that this one might be an intergalactic visitor. So it might have come from another galaxy and might just be visiting us temporarily. Uh, so we'll have to say hi as it goes by. <laughs> Again, one of my favorite stars to look at is Arcturus. Uh, we had Damien Zura uh, requested Alpha Centauri A. And uh, unfortunately, Alpha Centauri is part of uh, Cantaris, which is a southern constellation. And we can barely get some of the stars in this constellation, but unfortunately, Alpha Centauri is below the horizon all the time for us here in Flagstaff. So we never get to see that. Uh, Alpha Centauri is the closest star to us though, which is, uh, I've always kind of wanted to see it, but I've never gotten the chance. <laughs> And then uh, John Scarangello again has requested the Christmas tree cluster. Uh, it is kind of low, uh, but it, I think we can try for it and see if we can get it still. So uh, this cluster, uh, while I don't know too many in-depth facts about this one, I do know it's, it's quite pretty. And I think it's supposed to look like a Christmas tree when you look at it. Uh, however, when I've seen it, I personally haven't seen the Christmas tree shape. <laughs> it takes a little bit of imagination for some of these, for some of these clusters to look like what they're named after. Uh, but here it is. Here's our Christmas tree cluster. We got one really bright star right there in the center. And then all of the stars that you see in the field of view here, they are part of this cluster. Um, uh, but yeah, that's a, uh, this is an open star cluster. So that means unlike the globular cluster, these stars are not going to be uh, as densely packed together as you would with the other one. Um, and these ones are going to be younger stars and over time they're going to migrate away from each other and they're not going to be hanging out together forever and ever. Uh, all right, so uh, we had someone request M51 and or M81. And those are both great galaxies and I don't see why we can do both. So uh, let's go ahead and look at M51 first, which is the Whirlpool galaxy. Here it is. <clears throat> so Whirl, uh, the Whirlpool galaxy, actually galaxies just in general are my favorite things to image through this telescope and just to look at in general. And here in the springtime, we like to call it galaxy season because in Leo and in Virgo, 
we can find the Virgo supercluster, which is a cluster of galaxies, cont contains hundreds of galaxies, all in this general area of the sky. And if you just point your telescope pretty much anywhere in between Leo and Virgo, you're bound to land on a galaxy or 10. Uh, <laughs> you can take your own little mini deep fields doing that. Uh, now the Whirlpool galaxy is one of the brighter galaxies. It's relatively close by in the tens of millions of light years compared to the hundreds of millions like the ones in the supercluster. This one is actually not part of the Virgo supercluster. It's found in the constellation Ursa Major. And you can see that this galaxy, it's got these really gorgeous spiral arms to it. This is what we would call a grand design spiral galaxy because it has this perfect spiral structure. But it's not alone. There's a little companion dwarf galaxy, that a little tiny one there just on the bottom, that's just a little bit, gotten a little bit too close to the Whirlpool galaxy. And now you can see the Whirlpool galaxy is actually stealing stars right off of that little mini dwarf galaxy. You can see this little trail of stars as they're kind of getting absorbed into its spiral arms. And this process of a big galaxy eating up a little galaxy like this is called galactic cannibalism. And as it turns out, all galaxies are cannibals at some point or another, including our own Milky Way. And uh, so this happens pretty frequently, collisions with other galaxies. And uh, since we're on the subject and we did get the request for it, let's uh, send the telescope straight over to M81, which is the better of the two Bodes Nebulae, which is probably a very subjective opinion, but uh, it's true. <laughs> uh, so M81 is part of a galaxy pair, Bodes Galaxy and the Cigar Galaxy. Unfortunately, we can't get both of them in the field of view at the same time. Our camera here has too small of a field of view for that, so we can do one or the other, basically. And uh, while the Cigar Galaxy is brighter and easier to see through the eyepiece of a telescope, I think Bode's Nebula is just a little bit more photogenic. Again, it has those spiral arms. You can see this is another galaxy. It's a face-on galaxy, and you can see uh, two of these spiral arms. And you can see some of these uh, dust lanes, these dark areas going right through it. And right at the very center, we have our galactic core. So that's where the majority of the stars in the galaxy are located. Uh, I guess we had something fly by, like a satellite or something, which is what that white line is right there. We get satellites photobombing our pictures all the time. Yeah. Uh, so M81, uh, Bode's Nebula, and M82, the Cigar Galaxy, they're about 10 million light years away or so, and they are still far enough apart that we don't see them doing, they're not changing their shapes too much, but they are interacting with each other. And at some point, a couple million to a couple billion years from now, they will merge together to become a, a bigger galaxy. And so this is another example of that galactic cannibalism. But since they're about the same size as each other, they're going to pr pretty much just destroy each other's shapes <laughs> and make a big mess in space. Uh, all right, we have someone requesting uh, Betelgeuse. However, Betelgeuse, again, because of our trees, is a little bit too low in the sky, so we're not going to be able to look at Betelgeuse tonight, although I think I just said that three times. I'm sorry. Uh, that is my all-time favorite star, <laughs> uh, but it's too low now for us. We'll have to wait till next winter. And then we have someone looking at M105, or someone's requested M105. So let's go ahead and look at that. And uh, uh, so this one is a galaxy that we're going to be seeing, but I don't think I've actually looked at this particular one. Uh, it's one of our famous Messier objects. So Charles Messier, uh, 200 years ago or so now, he cataloged 110 different gala uh, galaxies, 110 different objects. He was searching for comets 
And he wrote down all of these objects that weren't comets, so he knew when he went back to them later what they were. Uh, so we actually see three galaxies in this field of view right here. This is another example of um, a deep, like a deep field that we can find over near Leo and near Virgo. So one of those galaxies looks like it's a, a regular shaped galaxy, but the other two are very clearly elliptical shaped galaxies. Uh, right there, yeah. So elliptical galaxies are the kind of end result after spiral galaxies have crashed into each other and merged together all the stars kind of get flung out in all sorts of places and uh, they end up making these big spherical or elliptical shapes and these are mostly stars as all of the gas has been triggered into star formation. Uh, so elliptical galaxies I think are certainly the most fascinating galaxies to learn about even if they're not very photogenic. <laughs> they kind of do look a little bit just like blobs but I love looking at elliptical galaxies. And of course, there's this little irregular one off to the side there, which is probably interacting with those two, which means, which is kind of explains why it has a funny shape. Uh, so thanks for requesting M105. I really like looking at that one. Uh, um, Hannah Zygo, uh, I'm going to ignore what you have said <laughs> entirely. <laughs> Uh, but uh, Lisa Boltman, <laughs> Lisa Boltman has requested a Cepheid variable. Uh, so we're going to have the telescope look at Beta Geminorium. I think I said that right. So Beta Geminorum is the second brightest star in Gemini. That's where uh, that came from. Uh, we have all of the named stars are also given catalog numbers like alpha, beta, gamma, which is the Greek letters, and the brightest is the beginning of the alphabet, and the fainter ones are going to be the end of the alphabet. Uh, so a Cepheid var variable, those are a type of variable star, and a variable star is going to be stars that kind of change in brightness periodically. And What's interesting about Cepheid variables is these ones are used as what we call standard candles. And standard candles tell us, uh, they can tell us the distances of stars. So as it turns out, all Cepheid variables, they have about the same absolute magnitude or exactly how far it would be from, I think, 10 parsecs away from a star, the absolute magnitude. They all have that same absolute magnitude, which means that if we have one from Earth that looks fainter than another, we can actually gauge the distances pretty easily with Cepheid variables. And about 100 years ago or so, Henrietta Swan Leavitt, who was an astronomer slash cataloger, she was using Cepheid variables as standard candles to confirm the theory of the expanding universe. Uh, and that theory of the expanding universe, which Edwin Hubble is most famous for coming up with at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, wouldn't have been possible if Vesto Slipher here at Lowell Observatory hadn't taken data of um, the redshift of various spiral nebulae, including the Sombrero Galaxy and the, uh, well, the Andromeda Galaxy, but that one's blue shifted, so I'm not sure if that one counts anymore. Uh, but yeah, so Vesto Slipher was uh, he detected a redshift in about 20 or so spiral galaxies, or what they called nebulae at the time, and uh, that helped And Edwin Hubble come up with this theory of the expanding universe. Uh, so Cepheid variables are pretty important stars when it comes to gauging distances in other galaxies even. You can, you can find Cepheid variables and be like, oh, well, this is how far this galaxy is. As it turns out, distance is one of the most difficult things to measure with stars and other things in space. Uh, because the farther away it is, the harder it is to figure out how far away it is. Uh, so yeah, that one right there, that's a beta geminorium, um, one of those Cepheid variables. We can't really get Cepheus right now, which is where Cepheid variables came from, because that one is a little bit too low on the horizon for us right now. Lisa Boltman has also asked for, uh, oh, I just got the same question twice here, sorry. <laughs> Frank Miller has asked for comment C2020, um, R4 Atlas, 
And I believe that we can. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to go to this comment over here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so one of the sometimes we can't just search for the name with the program that we use. So we have to enter its coordinates. And that's what my telescope operator, Claire, is doing right now, is she's entering the coordinates. And we use right ascension, or RA, which, as you can see, uses time units. And that's how far east or west something is. And then uh, declination is how far north or south something is. And that's the declination lines run parallel to latitude lines on Earth. And right ascension lines, uh, they do run parallel to our uh, longitude lines on Earth, but we use time instead. Uh, yeah, so here it is. Here's our little comet right there. So comets always look like little fuzzy balls, at least when they're close to Earth like this and they're still far away from us. Because what's happening is as it gets closer to the sun, the, the ices, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, water, stuff like that, uh, it's going to start to sublimate. It's going to turn from a solid into a gas and it starts to gas out. And so now we have uh, this, we have this tail, we have a couple tails. Although with our telescope, uh, we usually can only see one because one of them is going to be heavily ionized and then one of them is going to be really dusty. And I believe the one that we can see is the really ionized, the brighter one. And the dusty one is usually visible <laughs> only when it's a lot closer to us. Um, so, uh, yeah, so this comet, I'm guessing just from its name, I haven't heard of it until now, uh, but guessing just from its name, it was discovered uh, last year in 2020. And it was discovered by, uh, usually, usually the discoverer gets their name in the comments somewhere. So I guess R4 Atlas was uh, the discoverer. So it was a telescope or an organization there. Um, we have some people asking for, uh, Dulce Marist has asked for the Seven Sisters or the Pleiades. And those ones, unfortunately, they have set below the horizon. Uh, those ones are more prominent during the winter time. And uh, Jacqueline Belly has also asked for NGC 224, which is um, the M31 or the Andromeda Galaxy, and that one is also set uh, below the horizon as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, but we have Tom, uh, Tom Sarko again has requested for M97, the Owl Nebula. Uh, absolutely, this is one of my favorite planetary nebulae to look at. Uh, the first one that we looked at was really far away, so it looked like a kind of tiny little dot. And the Owl Nebula is a lot closer, so it's actually a lot bigger in size, or to us anyway. Uh, so once we get the telescope moving, uh, we'll start to see it uh, a little bit better. Uh, but you can kind of see this hazy blob right in the center of the screen right there. And there's two kind of void spots and it's supposed to look like the face of an owl. That's where it gets its name from. We can find the Owl Nebula over in Ursa Major or the Great Bear. It's just hanging out basically right on top of it. <laughs> so uh, this, is, this is one of my favorite planetary nebulae just because it is a lot bigger than, or at least apparently from our perspective, it looks a lot bigger. Uh, than some of the other ones uh, that we can see, even though planetary nebulae are some of the most abundant things in the early spring and winter sky. And uh, although this one is one of the fainter ones and a little bit harder to see if you were to look at it through the eyepiece of a telescope. Um, and then uh, I believe I believe that we're going to look at the uh, Lawn Sprinkler Nebula, which <laughs> uh, is NGC 4361. So we have another planetary nebula because, again, they're pretty abundant in the sky right now, those ones and galaxies as well. And uh, we are getting close to the end of the time that we have for today. So now is the time that if you have any last minute requests, you'll want to you'll actually want to send those in pretty quickly. So <clears throat> if we don't get any requests soon, we can make the Lawn Sprinkler Nebula uh, the very last one um, 
that we'll see. And um, uh, we also had another request for the Pleiades, which is the same thing as M45. So yeah, just again, the Pleiades M45, they're too low in the sky. They're actually below the horizon for us. We'll have to wait until next fall when they start to rise again. Um, all right, so yeah, here we have the Lawn Sprinkler Nebula. You can kind of see why it's named that because it kind of looks like the water, like as it's spinning around the water. <clears throat> and this kind of happens with planetary nebulae sometimes as these stars are spinning pretty quickly and they're outgassing. Uh, so this gas that's coming out of their poles sometimes will spin around with them and it kind of makes really intricate shapes like this. Yeah, so this is uh, another, we, we looked at a lot of planetary nebulae tonight and I hope you guys learned enough about them or learned a lot about them. They are my favorite things to talk about. I could easily go on forever. Uh, but we don't we don't have a lot of time left. Uh, so uh, if no one else has any more questions or comments, I think we'll go ahead and have to, uh, we're gonna go ahead and get ready to sign off here. Uh, so if you decided that you just haven't had enough of this interacting stargazing and you know, this was way too short, well, get ready. <laughs> Uh, oh, someone actually requested M109, M109 or Messier 109. I haven't seen this. It's a galaxy, so it's probably over there in the Virgo area. We might as well take a look at that real quick. In about 15 seconds or so. I'm not sure what this one is. I Again, this is one of Messier's 110 objects. This was literally at the end of his list. <laughs> Uh, and I just haven't gotten a chance to look at this one. And there's another beautiful spiral galaxy. And then we'll get another clearer picture once the star trails go away. And you can see this one's actually a barred spiral galaxy, which is special because it has this bar right in the center. And it's got a couple really tightly wound spiral, uh, one, two tightly wound spiral arms. And the bars in these galaxies are still kind of a mystery. Astronomers are still not too sure exactly what causes the bar. They're not even sure what causes the spiral arms. Like it's all a mystery really. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but yeah, we're gonna go ahead. And if you guys decided that this is not enough for you, you want to do more interactive stargazing, well, boy, do I have news for you. Uh, right, uh, right after this stream ends, if you go right over to Twitch, Lowell Observatory does do more interactive stargazing on Twitch. And our, my friends Hannah and Jacob will be hosting that particular stream. So you guys head right on over there after this. Uh, don't forget, uh, if you haven't yet, give Lowell Observatory a nice like and a subscribe for this video. And uh, Hopefully I'll see you guys next week for next Tuesday's interactive stargazing and thank you guys very much.